This morning we'd like to draw your attention to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 14 and 15 where Solomon declared, I know that whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it and nothing can be taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. One of the attributes of God is that he is eternal. That is, God has always existed, and God will always exist. Exist. As we read in the psalm this morning, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. That word everlasting in Hebrew is an interesting word. It literally means beyond the vanishing point. So you let your mind go back, 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 back as far as your mind can go until you get to a vanishing point where you cannot comprehend or think of anything further back and that you get to sort of a vanishing point. Well, beyond that vanishing point, God existed. Let your mind go out in the future as far as you can think in the future until again you get to the vanishing point where your mind just cannot comprehend or conceive anything beyond that. And beyond that point, God will be there from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God, the eternal God. The eternal realm is outside of our domain because we live in a time continuum and everything we know has a beginning and an ending and we cannot think apart from a beginning and an ending, a start and a finish. Now, Einstein postulated the theory of the relativity of time. And he sought to point out that time is relative. Well, I'm no Einstein, but I figured that out when I was a kid. I knew that time was relative. I knew that when I was playing ball, time went fast. When I was practicing my violin, time dragged. And my theory was that time was relative to fun. The more fun you were having, the quicker time would go. And if you were going through a painful or boring experience, time would drag. And, and I had my whole theory of the relativity of time long before Einstein ever postulated his theory. But Einstein pop, uh, postulated his theory on the relative relativity of time with speed that time slows down as you are accelerating in speed and according to his theory if you could accelerate to the speed of light that time would become linear and would stand still or you would enter into the eternal domain where there is no time where time more or less just stands still in the eternal realm. And Einstein's theory of uh, t- relativity of time had to do with speed. Mine had to do with fun. But uh, his is probably more scientific than mine. And yet, nonetheless, uh, it is interesting, his theory of the relativity of time, if you go fast enough, uh, again, accelerating to the speed of light, that time would just become linear and would stand still. And thus it was postulated that if, theoretically impossible, but if we could build spaceships that could accelerate to the speed of time, that uh, men could leave the planet Earth on these spaceships once they had accelerated uh, to the speed of light, uh, they could travel on out into the universe, say to the 
Andromeda Galaxy, which is one and a half a million light years away. Uh, they could visit the uh, Andromeda Galaxy and return to the Earth. And by the time they got back to the Earth, uh, they would only be a day or so older, but the Earth would be some three million years older. And uh, the vestiges of our period of history would be totally lost and they wouldn't really recognize the earth that they returned to three million years from now, though they would just be a day or so older. Now, whether or not that is true, I don't know, but it's an interesting theory nonetheless. But God is outside of our time domain. He lives in the eternal and is not restricted or confined to the time domain as we are. And it is easy for God to prove to man that he exists outside of our time continuum. In order to prove it, God would only have to tell us something that is going to happen in time that we have not yet arrived at. And he could give us just a few details of those things that are going to happen so that when we finally caught up with that period of time and we saw them happening, we would understand that God dwells outside of the time continuum because he can speak of things uh, that have not yet taken place within the time continuum he could give you details of them, and when these things then came to pass, you would know that God knew what he was talking about, that he was outside of the time domain and could see further down the road than what time has yet come to. And the Bible is filled with thousands of instances where God has spoken of events before they ever took place gave even intricate details of what would happen, when it would happen, and how it would happen. And in time, we caught up with it. And the things happened just as God said they would. Things are happening in our world today just as God said they would. We've finally caught up with some of the prophecies that were uttered over 2,500 years ago, and, and they're happening in our world today. We've finally caught up in this time continuum with these things that God spoke about 2,500 years ago. God has spoken of things that we have not yet caught up with. They haven't yet transpired, but given a little more time and they will transpire. And you'll see the fulfillment of them also. But by his ability to speak of these things before they ever exist is proof that God does exist outside of the time continuum in which we live. Now here on the planet Earth, we measure time by... Uh, the revolution of the earth on its axis and the orbit of the earth around the sun. As the earth spins on its axis every 23 hours and 56 minutes, nine and four one hundredths of a second, we say that a day has passed. And every time the earth makes its complete orbit around the sun, we say a year has passed. And when the earth gets to the same place in its orbit around the sun as it was on June 25th, uh, I say I am now a year older. The earth has made one more revolution around the sun since I was born. And so we measure our time uh, and it's relative to the earth spinning on its axis and the earth orbiting around the sun. Now, uh, if you lived on the planet Venus, uh, you would actually have lived less 
days than years. For it takes 243 days for Venus to make its orbit around the sun, but it only spins on its axis once every 255 days. So you would be, you would have lived less days than you had years on the planet Venus, which would be an interesting phenomena. Uh, if you lived on the planet Jupiter, well, you would have lived many more days because the planet Jupiter really is spinning fast. It spins on its uh, axis once every nine hours and 55 minutes. So the days would be quite a bit shorter on Jupiter. Nine hours and 55 minutes long. But your years on Jupiter would be 4,333 days. Or uh, you, if you wanted to figure how many years old you were on Jupiter, you pretty much just divide your current age by 11 and you'd find out how many years you were on Jupiter. So for that person that is looking for more hours in the day, I would recommend you go to the planet Venus. For each day is 255 Earth days long, and so you should find plenty of hours in the day on the planet Venus. Now, the theologians have a term, the eternal now, by which they seek to express one of the phenomena of eternity, and that is that there is no time. That everything that happens, happens in the present. There is no real past or future. It is the eternal now. As God expressed in his name, I am that I am. And, and that's present tense, now. God could never say I was or I shall be. I am, always. Self-existent, eternal. I am now. Now I say, well, I was. And I say, I hope to be. And the moment I say I am, that's past tense. And so I was two seconds ago when I said I am. But not so with God. Now, uh, our next verse sort of gives you a hint to this. That which hath been is now. And that which shall be has already been. It's all happening right now. That which has been is now. That which is going to be already been, has been, is now. So the eternal now. As Peter tried to define for us the time factor with God he said for a day is as a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years as a day uh, he took that I guess from the psalm that we read this morning because that's basically uh, what we read in the uh, third verse I believe it was of the psalm no, it was in uh, uh, fourth verse for a thousand years in thy sight or as but yesterday when it is past so, uh, God dwells in the eternal. And as the scripture text said, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. For God dwells and exists in that realm of the eternal. Now, I might warn you, that our minds are not capable of comprehending eternity. And a lot of people have blown circuits in their minds seeking to comprehend eternity and have become spacey. So I don't really recommend that you try to understand 
uh, eternity. Uh, it, it's possible to blow fuses in your brains seeking to do so. But the fact that God is eternal and I live in the time continuum creates a problem of my understanding of God. Not just understanding the nature of God or the attributes of God, but it creates a problem in my understanding of the ways of God in my life. I know, Solomon said, that whatever God does is forever. As God deals with me, he is always dealing with eternity in view. Now, because I live in the time continuum, I'm always interested in the immediate. What's happening to me right now? God is interested in what is happening to me eternally. And God is always working with the eternal view where I am always thinking in the immediate situation. I'm concerned about the pain that I'm feeling right now. I'm concerned about the problems that I'm facing today. The pressure that I'm under at this moment. And I'm always thinking in the realm of the moment and the effect upon me today and the possible effect tomorrow. But God is always dealing with the eternal. The value that it will bring for me eternally. And because of the difference here. God dealing with me in the eternal and my always evaluating in the present. I many times find myself at odds with God and the work of God in my life. With the psalmist, I often am crying, How long, O Lord, how long? And as I said earlier, with my own theory of the relativity of time, when you're going through a painful experience, it seems like forever. I can remember when I injured my knee in college football, tore the ligaments and the cartilages there in my knee and was laid up for several months out of football for the season. The pain of that knee, the inability to really put any weight on it, the having to go on crutches, I thought that I was forever on those crutches. I began to wonder if I would ever be able to walk again. Pain has a way of stretching out time. And it seems like you're going through this experience forever. You can't hardly remember a time when you weren't plagued by this thing. And you're sure that you're going to be plagued by it as long as you live. It's a funny thing about time, the way it just sort of, I mean pain, it just sort of makes time stand still. And with the psalmist we say, how long, O Lord, how long? However, as I get down the road a little farther and I begin to catch up with time, or time begins to catch up with me, I'm not sure what happens. I can look back upon my suffering, upon those experiences, and I can see now the, the, the experience in a different light because I can begin to see the purpose of God in that experience. I can see what God was doing and the plan of God, what He was seeking to work out in my life, those eternal purposes of God that were being accomplished. And I can see the wisdom of God. I can see how wise God was in the way that he was dealing with me. For he was working out eternal purposes. And thus Paul the Apostle, in looking back on his own experiences, said, For the light affliction which was but for a moment 
worketh an eternal weight of glory. Yes, it was an affliction, but it passed. But God, through it, was working out an eternal plan. The eternal purposes of God do not always fit with my present plans or desires. And I've often misjudged God when my plans went awry. I felt that God didn't love me. That God didn't really understand the situation. I felt that God was being mean to me. I felt that God didn't care. He had forsaken me. And I was like a pouting little child crying because my parents didn't love me because they wouldn't let me play on the freeway. Life is sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. And so many times we're trying to understand one of the little individual pieces apart from the whole picture. And we try to figure out how this event in our life fits in to the whole scheme of things. But as we go through life and more and more of the pieces are put together, we begin to see the whole picture. So that by the time you get to my age and you're almost the end of the road and the last piece of the puzzle is just about in place, you can begin to look back and say, oh yes, I can see that. Look at how it's developing. Look at the picture there now. Can't you see? There's only a few pieces that are left to be put in and the picture will be complete. But you begin to understand those earlier experiences of life that were so difficult, that were so hard. Those trials and those testings that we went through. I begin now to understand God's purpose in those testings. For God had in mind to place certain responsibilities upon me. It was necessary that he prepare me for those responsibilities. And by the testings and by the trials, he was only preparing the vessel that he might use that vessel for his eternal purposes down the road. And so as God works in our lives, as the day unfolds and a piece comes that we cannot see how it fits into the total picture and we study that and we look at it and we try to figure it out, it becomes an enigma and a mystery to us. There are times in working a jigsaw puzzle that I find a piece that I'm sure doesn't fit in this puzzle. Somehow the manufacturer got things mixed up and he put a couple of pieces in that should have gone in another picture someplace. They surely don't fit in my picture, at least as I think it should be. And there are always those times when we declare they've left a piece of the puzzle out. We've searched and searched and we know exactly what it must look like and, and we can't find it. And uh, a lot of times... It, it, Whenever we go on vacation, we always buy one of these huge puzzles, and part of the vacation process is just, you know, putting a jigsaw puzzle together, and inevitably, we'll say, well, now that piece of the puzzle is missing, you know, that they, they left that one out, or that one's lost or something, but, you know, in time... There it is. Someone maybe had it in their pocket, we think, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> It's all there. And when the final piece of the puzzle is put in and you see the whole picture, it's beautiful. You just sort of stand in awe and you say, isn't that beautiful? And when God puts the final pieces together in our life, when the purposes of God have been complete, when he's got the whole thing together, 
then we'll stand and we'll look and we'll say, isn't that beautiful? That work of God, as he was working his eternal plan and his eternal purposes in our life. You see, God always sees the whole picture. And as he works, he is always working with the whole picture in view. I know that whatever God does is forever, but that's where the problem arises. Because I can't see the whole picture yet. And I don't understand the present because I can't see it as it relates to the whole. Now, Solomon said, nothing can be put to it nor anything taken from it. The work of God, it's, it, it's forever. It's eternal. You can't really add to the work of God. You can't really take away from the work of God. Now, that doesn't stop us from trying. And many times I find myself trying to add to that work of God in my life. And sometimes I find myself trying to take away some of the pieces. Because of my limited understanding, not knowing the future, I tried to add things to my life that I know now would have been a tremendous detriment to me. The things that I tried to add to my life could have destroyed me and destroyed my usefulness for God. And so I am glad that God stopped me when I tried to add those things. Though at the time, I thought that God wasn't being fair. I thought that he was being rather cruel. And he surely didn't understand. But later on, I realized the wisdom of God in not allowing those things that I desired. I sought to escape from certain trials things that were happening to me that were heavy pressured experiences. But I didn't know that this testing of God was to prepare me for the things that he was wanting to entrust in my hands in the future. Now because the work of God is forever, and shall be forever, I, if I am wise, will just commit myself to be controlled and to be guided by God. I'll not try to call the shots or dictate to God what should be done in my life. Because I know that what God does is forever and thus his ways are best. His ways are complete. I really can't add to them nor take away from them. Now, we are then told that the purpose of this is that we might reverence God. We might come to respect God and reverence God. How foolish are those doctrines that are being expounded in many of the charismatic churches today that speak of writing your own ticket with God. Or they talk about commanding God. Or you can have what you want to have. You can be what you want to be. Just exercise your faith in making your positive confession. And God will become your genie and will fulfill your wishes. How ridiculous. How dishonoring. You see, what these things are doing, these doctrines are saying, is that I can be God. I can have my own will. 
I can bring about my own purposes. That God must obey my commands if I speak the word of faith. And he must yield to this positive confession and to this spoken word, the rima. But that's not reverencing God and that's not really understanding the wisdom of God. That's really exalting my own wisdom above his. My ways above his. That's saying I know better than God what's best for me. Paul the Apostle warns us that the wrath of God is going to come against those who, when they knew God, did not glorify him as God. And to seek to usurp your will over his. Your ways over his. Seeking to cause God to yield to your desires is surely not glorifying God as God. That is exalting your wisdom above His and your ways above His. And that's not to glorify God as God. Whatever God does is forever. And it's for your eternal good and your eternal benefit. What I do is for now. My temporary good or benefit. That's what I have in mind. Because I dwell in the time continuum. But as the value of eternity is eons ahead of the value of the present. There is that gap again between the finite and the infinite. And I, being a finite man, living in time, finite space and continuum, would be wise to just commit my ways unto an eternal God of infinite wisdom who lives in that eternal realm and does his work, which is forever. I know that whatever God does is forever. And God has saved me and forgiven me my sins. I'm glad that what he does is forever. I rest in that today. And I commit myself and my ways unto the wisdom of the eternal God to work out his eternal plan and purpose in my life, which I know is best for me. And I know that when he's through, the picture will be perfect. You won't be able to add anything to it, and you won't want to take away anything from it. The ways of God are perfect. Shall we pray? Father, help us to just trust you, Lord, more fully and more completely. We don't ask that you help us to understand you, Lord, because we realize that living in this time continuum, we cannot understand the eternal. Living within our limitations, we cannot understand a limitless God. But Lord, just help us to trust, to trust you more to commit our ways unto you that you might work your eternal work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, 
it's a good thing I'm not in the driver's seat because I'm blind. I don't know what's down the road. I can't see what's down the road. You wouldn't want some guy driving you down the freeway who was blind. God sees. God knows what's down the road. He knows every turn. He knows every danger. He knows every problem that lies down the road. He can see what's ahead. And that's why it would be so foolish for me to say, move over, God, let me get in the driver's seat. I'll take over from here. That's not glorifying him as God. But to just say, Lord, I trust you. You stay in the driver's seat. I'll just sit here. <laughs> Sometimes I'll hang on. My knuckles will get white. I think that maybe you're going to go over the cliff, but... I'll just trust you, Lord, to get me safely home. And you know you can. Just commit your ways unto the Lord. Trust always in him, and he shall bring it to pass. His perfect plan, his will in your life. Any man... who is a self-made man is a fool. Any man who tries to take the reins to guide his own life is a fool. Wisdom would dictate that I should turn the reins over to him. And that's exactly what he said. Come unto me, all ye that labor, are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. That is, let me take over the reins of your life. For he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I know that whatever God does is forever. He is working out his eternal purposes in my life. I want it that way. I wouldn't want it any other way. And so you are either living a self-governed life or a God-governed life. One is sheer folly. The other is pure wisdom. If you'd like to turn the reins of your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ today, yield your future and the direction to him, I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room. Pastors and counselors will be back there to pray with you and to help you to discover God's plan. Whatever God does is forever. It's good. It's right.